Good morning and grace and peace to you. I said you might hear that again. You can't have too much grace and peace, right? Yeah, amen to that. Need some truth as well. But if you want to turn in your Bibles to Philippians 127, we're going to start there in a moment on your little ticket. Please keep in prayer all those who are in need of prayer. Truly, victory is in Jesus. We do not win that victory on our own. He is the sum total of all things godly and all things human. He is indeed our Savior. We're going to talk about some worthy men this morning. And we're going to start here in Philippians 1.27 and This is a little bit of a strange lesson, I'll just tell you that right up front. I'm coming at this from a little bit different angle, but I think you're going to see when I get done with it where I've been going, and we're going to learn a a good bit. Paul writes to the Philippians here, he says, Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Paul here wants the uh, Philippians to live a life that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. That means, of course, it's compatible with the message, the power, and understands the crucial importance of the gospel, that it's not just something you do every once in a while, but it's the very essence of life, the gospel of Jesus Christ that which gives us salvation and brings eternal life, forgiveness of sins, and all those things. And they would be living a lifestyle that reflects that, the importance of the gospel. Other scriptures exhort Christians to live lives worthy of the saints, our calling, the kingdom, the Lord, and so forth. And uh, it indicates, you know, the life of The Christian is a very serious undertaking. The word we're using here, worthy, is from the Greek axios, which means of weight or worth. Um, And I think we can best understand this back in the day, back in Bible times, even back earlier in our own country, uh, money was coins, coinage, wasn't it? And in fact, uh, there were gold coins that were used as money in this country and certainly back in the day of of Christ. And uh, in our day, maybe some of you can remember there used to be really silver in our silver coins, you know, the quarter and so forth. I don't know even if it has any silver anymore, I'm not sure. But those were the weighty metals, okay, and therefore those were the ones of value. And so that's what money was made from. And if you got the the copper, the penny, you know, that was just made out of copper, and that wasn't worth very much. So uh, the weightier metals were worth something, and that's that's the idea here, that something of worth is that which is weighty. And so when we start to think about people, we start to think about people who have a strong character. People, you've probably been in organizations or been around people where you heard somebody say, well, he carries a lot of weight. Did you ever hear that? She carries a lot of weight. Or he's a lightweight. You know, you can go talk to him and he can say a whole bunch of stuff, but nothing ever happens, you know. It's, he's, there's not much to that person. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about here, a worthy person, one who carries weight. So we're going to look at four individuals here very quickly uh, that we're, we consider worthy, and we're going to look at their character, what they did, and maybe compare ourselves to them to see, am I a worthy individual? Am I a weighty person? Do I count for anything, or am I just a flyby? You know, I'm not, I'm not much of an individual at all. 
And then we're going to sum it up at the end after we look at these four individuals, and we're going to have a question as to, well, why did Jeff pick these individuals and who they were? And we're going to have a bottom line summary for what, uh, what was it about them that caused them to be able to be worthy. All right, enough introduction. Let's go to Luke chapter 7. We're going to talk here about the centurion at Capernaum. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, the Roman army, the centurion, of course, was a, a, a soldier who was in charge of 100 men. Now, sometimes it ended up being more than 100 or sometimes less than 100, but that was the basic arrangement. And he was a person who had, uh, had experience, okay, probably worked his way up through the ranks. He had seen a lot. He had been in battle and so forth. And so, you know, here is an individual that has been around. So Luke 7, we're going to start with verse 1. <clears throat> When he completed all his discourse, meaning we're talking about Jesus, in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum. And a centurion slave, who was highly regarded by him, was sick and about to die. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him to come and save the life of his slave. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly implored him, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this to him. For he loves our nation, and it was he who built us our synagogue. Now Jesus started on his way with them, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed." For I also am a man placed under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him and turned and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good hell. So we have the testimony here of these Jewish elders that this centurion was worthy for Jesus to go and grant the request to heal his servant. We uh, in the leadership of the church run into this from time to time. I know Mike and Mike will attest to this. Don's not here but he will too. That. Sometimes people come to ask for help, and the thought goes through our mind is, are they worthy? And, and the question really is, are they just playing the system? Do they really need help? Are, are, they, are they down and out? Or are they just looking for a handout, they're not willing to work, and that kind of a thing? And so that can often go through our head if they are worthy or not. What made this centurion worthy to these Jewish elders? First, they said he loves our nation. Well, just to say you love somebody doesn't really mean much if you don't follow through with action, right? I think we've seen this happen a lot of times with, in particular, marriages. Oh, honey, I love you, but then, you know, the man runs out and wastes the paycheck or, you know, gets with another woman. Words mean nothing. So how did this centurion demonstrate that he actually loved the Jewish nation? What did he say? He's built us our synagogue. Now there's some action. There's something weighty on this man's chart, if you will, in this column for him that says, hey, he really does love the Jewish people. He built a synagogue for them. He did something good. His words were fulfilled, a deed of substance. And so this makes a weighty person when you follow through with what you say. When you say something, when you make a promise, 
When you say, I love you, when you say, I'll do this, I'll do that, you follow through with it. That makes a worthy individual. You are a weighty person. You can be counted on. You can be trusted. I can go to you if I have a problem, and I know that you will help do what you can. So we said this happens a lot with husbands and wives, parents and children. Uh, I remember when the kids were growing up, and I would often make a promise to them. I will do this, we'll do that, we'll go here, you know, whatever it was, or I'll do this for you. And I was always careful before I said I will do it, that I knew I would do it. That I was not just saying something to pass the moment, to get off the hook, to move on, and then to come back and say, oh, I didn't really mean that or I forgot. Because words have meaning. And in this case, you know, the words we say should be followed up with the action if we make a promise or say we're going to do something. This also uh, comes to bear when we're talking about me and the Lord, right? You and the Lord. We have, in essence, all made promises to the Almighty and to Jesus Christ himself, if we are Christian, that we will serve him and do his will. That comes with the territory. It comes without saying. So does, does Jesus consider me a worthy person? Have I kept my word to him as I wear his name? Something serious to think about. You know, and this is the Mike prayed that we'll be the, truly be the salt of the earth and light of the world. That people will see in us, us Jesus Christ and they will hear us talking about him, telling of his goodness, and, re and reminding people of the gospel, the good news. Are we worthy? Are we weighty people? It's interesting here, you know, in, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, Jesus is rarely amazed. You know, he is God in the flesh. I mean, he's seen it all. He knows everything. But here this centurion amazes him. The first thing about him is that he understood authority, that some people are greater and worthier than others. You know, he says there, you know, Lord, don't trouble yourself. I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. You know, I understand about just telling someone to do something and they do it. Obviously, he had heard about Jesus. He had heard of his heal, being able to heal, of his casting out demons. In essence, this centurion is saying to Jesus, you have more authority than I do. He really is acknowledging that. Now, whether or not he accepted that he was God in the flesh or the Jewish Messiah, I don't know. But he was recognizing that Jesus had this power, this authority. He says, I'm not worthy for you to even come under my roof. So that amazed Jesus. Also, verse 9, his faith. that he believed from a distance. All you have to do is say the word. I know what that's like to say a word and people do something. You can just say the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus marvels. He says, I've not even seen faith like this in Israel out of this <clears throat> Roman centurion. The centurion was obviously a worthy individual, and as we look at his life and what he did, you know, are we the same? You know, when Jesus says in the Word, and the Word tells us, don't be afraid, don't worry, trust, pray, do we take Jesus at his word? Do we have that faith in him? That he'll just speak the Word, 
and he'll take care of our needs. So that's the first one. Let's go to Mark 15, right where we were this morning in the other reading. But on down verse 36 at the foot of the cross. Mark 15, 36. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave him, meaning Jesus, a drink, saying, Let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last, and the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who was standing right in front of him saw the way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. As we said earlier, the centurions had been through it. They had seen battle. They had seen death. They had seen maiming. This centurion, no doubt, was well-versed, trained, and skilled in executions of all kind by the Romans. That's what his job was right now, to crucify. And so we would understand that as far as his Witnessing here, he's a weighty person. He's experienced, and we should listen to what he says. So he's observing Jesus breathing his last. And it says here, when he saw the way he breathed his last, truly this man was the son of God. Something about the way Jesus conducted himself on the cross and just the way he, he died, breathed his last, was different about all the other individuals that he had seen been a part of crucifying. So this, this centurion was an honest man. He says in his mind, there is something truly different about this Jesus of Nazareth. And it, is such a, it was such a difference, we don't know exactly what it was, but we're trusting this man because of his experience, that he says, truly, this was a son of God, or if you look at the footnote, a son of the gods or something like that, it was, you know, I don't know if he thought again, he was the, the son of the Almighty, you know, knowing a, a Roman and all their gods. But he was saying, this is, this is a God in the flesh here. A son of God. He was honest about what he saw. And he said so. So we draw from this centurion the fact that worthy people are honest about what they see and hear. If we see something that is worthy of praise, no matter who it's from, an individual that we perhaps don't like or don't care about, but we see them do a good deed, do we praise them? Or do we turn away because I don't happen to like that person? Or if we hear of things that are wrong, evil coming from someone that we really like? Do we say, oh, no, just forget it? Are we honest in what we see and what we hear? This man, you know, I don't know what it took. It took, you know, what, what he saw in Jesus. He, he was honest, and he said, this man is the son of the gods, the way he breathed his last. Okay, Acts chapter 10. We're probably very familiar with this uh, fellow, this centurion, Cornelius. Acts chapter 10. Very briefly recounting the story. Uh, Peter was on the top of his housetop praying. He was in Joppa. And uh, I think he was in Joppa, right? And uh, he had received the, uh, the vision from God about the sheet being let down with the animals, and some of them were unclean animals, and, 
And Peter said, no, Lord, I'll, I'll not eat of the unclean animals. I've never, never done that. And God says, you know, what I've declared to be clean, it's clean. You know, I'm paraphrasing here. And so Peter was kind of set up for that. We're going to read here where uh, about Cornelius. He received a visit from an angel and said for him to send a job and call for Peter. And Peter's going to come and he's going to tell you some things. So that, that brings us here at Acts 10, 1. There was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man, and one who feared God with all his household, and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. And then down on down the same chapter there, verse 21, when these men came to Peter, and Peter says, you know, what's this all about? Verse 21, Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I am the one you're looking for. What's the reason for which you've come? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. Of course, as we know, Cornelius was the first Gentile convert, he and his household, to, to Christ. Before that, it was only, only for the Jews, and that was the plan, the Jew first and then the Greek. In God's mind, and here, you know, God is really making an assessment here of Cornelius. What made Cornelius the worthy person for whom the gospel would first be preached and for him to have the opportunity to be saved? What was it about him? Well, we're told here. First, it says he feared God. Now, He's not talking about the Roman gods, the pagan gods here now, as we can plainly see. Somehow, over the course of time, Cornelius had come to believe in Yahweh, the God of Israel. I am who I am. We're not told how, but obviously he had come to believe in him. And it says he feared God. He feared God says, with all his household. This tells me that this man was a good teacher and set a good example in his house to do what was right and that he truly cared about his family and about his household. He wasn't just, you know, strutting around saying, you know, we talked about authority a little bit ago. I'm the one in charge. I'm the head of the house. You just do what I say. No, this was not Cornelius. He really loved his family. He loved his servants. He was teaching them. He was kind. And yeah, he, he was in charge, but you know, in the right way, in the way God leads us, in the way God has authority over us. He just doesn't tell us what to do. He sets an example and he blesses us to be able to do it. it says he gave many alms, good deeds those in need. The New American Standard I read there has Jewish in quotes, or italics rather. I don't, I don't know necessarily that the text demands Jewish, although I'm sure he gave alms to the Jews, but he just, I think the text just says he gave alms to the people. To anyone who was in need, he was, he was open, you know. Again, we see the good deeds in this man. And it says he prayed to God continually. Continually. He worshiped. He trusted God. He believed in God. He thought God would answer his prayers. This, this is amazing for a pagan Roman soldier that he had come to this point in his life. And God saw us 
this worthiness in him to, hey, this is a man. We're going to open the door to the Gentiles. So Cornelius, I think who can say, was a very worthy and weighty person. So what about me? Do I fear God like Cornelius? You know, I'm not cowering in the corner, scared of God type thing, but do I absolutely respect and honor God and in awe of God? And yes, when I, I hear the thunders and the lightnings, that's the power of God. That strikes a little bit of fear in my heart. I love the thoughts there in Job, I think, about him riding on the wings of the wind. It's either in Job or Psalms. That's God's presence. That's his power. He's around. The Lord's here this morning. Do I fear God? Does it help me in my conduct? What about my household, my family, my friends? Do I influence them? Do I encourage them? Do I love them? Do I correct them when they need corrected? But do I praise them when they need praise? Gives many alms. Do I help people in need? Maybe through the church. We're talking about helping out these kids in Haiti right now. Or maybe not. Maybe just in my neighborhood. Maybe one of my friends needs help. Maybe somebody in my family needs help. This, you know, this was built into this man. He, he, this was just his nature. This was his character. He, he wouldn't have to think about, gee, should I help this person or not? He was ready to help. Now he might have to say, oh, I'm ready to help now. Okay, what do we do? But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't so much a question of should I. It was maybe how much. And then he prayed to God continually. Are you putting your life totally and completely in the hands of God? We use the quotation a lot, pray without ceasing. That's kind of the same thing here, right? Pray to God continually about everything, everything that comes up, every decision, every day, every morning, every night before I go to bed. God be with me. God help me. God help my brother. God help my sister. Praying for Helen tomorrow to get well. Mike just thanked us for the prayers. Prayers matter because God matters. Prayers are meaningless without God. Okay, last one. On over in Acts 27. Here we have Paul uh, on his journey to Rome. He's been, uh, he's appealed to Caesar and all this wranglings and these appearances before these governors and all. And he says, I finally, I want, I'm appealing to Caesar. So he's, oh, you're going to Caesar. So Acts 27 and 1. When it was decided that we, Paul talking, or Luke is writing, should sail for Italy, they proceeded to deliver Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in an Adramidium ship, which was about to sail to the regions along the coast of Asia, we put out to sea, according, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul with consideration and allowed him to go to his friends and receive care. So here we have, and now you're seeing where Jeff's going with this lesson, another centurion, Julius. Appears to be a worthy man. What's he do? He treats Paul with consideration. You know, Paul had not, was not a vicious criminal. Paul hadn't murdered anybody. Paul hadn't stolen anything. There were just some questions about his, if you will, his religion and his conduct among the Jews. 
And so Julius evidently knew that, so he said, this guy is not someone to be feared. He's probably observed his conduct, and he says, there's no problem here really with this man. And so he allows him to go to his friends and receive care on this journey. So we would have to say that this centurion Julius was fair and understanding. He did not use a, sometimes like we do, a one-size-fits-all approach. If you're guilty, you're guilty, and well, we'll put you down in the hold of the ship and just leave you there. No, that was not Julius. He says, Paul, uh, he, he, uh, he hasn't done anything that bad. I'll let him go to his friend. He was an understanding person. And so, again, am I an understanding person? Do I try to see each situation, each individual in each situation and what happened and make a, an honest evaluation, judgment, if you will, before I say something or do something? You know, I think that shows a, a weighty individual, one who uses their mind uses their heart in every situation before they jump to conclusions. All right, as we wrap this up, we've, we've seen the conduct, the character of these four centurions. As we said, they are Roman, they were pagan, except we might Say Cornelius is an exception here, but at one point he was a pagan. He was a Roman. He's a soldier. They've been involved in killing. Why do we see them pointed out in the New Testament as good people, we'll say, doing good things? This is what struck me about this lesson. What what is it about these, you know, they're not, they're not Christian, if you will. They're not, they're not Jewish. They, they were pagan. But they're seen in a good light. They did good things. They were honorable. They were just. How is that possible? Well, if you can see there from your last scripture, we're going to read it from Genesis 1. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. All people are made in the image of God. And that image lingers down to this very moment. You know, we go back and forth about what that means. And sometimes we th talk about physical characteristics and Sometimes we talk about emotional characteristics, but here I think we're going to see that this means the capacity to do good. We're all made in the image of God, and that goodness can shine through. You probably know people yourself who are not, if you will, churchgoers, but you've seen them do good things, right? They probably helped you out. Yeah. And you say, well, how can that be if they're not, not a Christian? It's because they're made in the image of God. And that image is in every person. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 3, as he's talking about his prayer, he says he bows his knee to the Father from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. God is the father of us all. And I'm not saying that, you know, these people are saved or their lifestyle is approved by God. But all I'm saying is everybody has the capacity to do good, and that comes from the fact that they're all made in the image of God. And we should, I think we should try better to look for that in people, to look for the good, to praise the good, and to thank people when they do good. Even though we might say, you know, we, as we would look at that individual, that guy, and say, well, he's not a really very good person, but
but you, you've probably run into some, like we've said, he would give you the shirt off his back. But he's out there, you know, carousing every, every weekend. We've seen that. And so we need to appeal to that when we talk the gospel, when we talk to folks about doing good and doing good things that, you know, you're made in the image of God. Look at, look at the good things you do. That is God shining through you. Remember this. I got, got this little blurb written down here on my lesson. You have never met a person who is not made in the image of God. You've never met a person not made in the image of God. So look for and cultivate the good in every person and share that good news of life eternal, that they're made in the image of God and that God wants them to share eternity with him. God bless you.